Kagome, Kagome. Gateway of the Mind is a well-known creepypasta. A bunch of mad scientists attempting some unbelievably literal interpretation of a figure of speech. This experiment was performed promptly after World War II ended, and seems to fit in with a long line of strange experiments performed by the Nazis. The Nazi reign was famous for its backdoor scientists and occult researchers. Special expeditionary divisions of the Reich were often sent out in search of artifacts or locations of occult or religious significance. Meanwhile, in Germany, bunkers were assembled and mansions and castles were fitted with labyrinths and dungeons which were filled with strange experiments and research notes. Whenever the Allies found these places, they were often gutted, burned, or otherwise destroyed and abandoned. Whenever a lab was found intact, the research was often incoherent or missing, or later destroyed by the Allies to prevent the Nazis from recovering any hidden data. A lot of the Nazi experiments were kept under the radar, until recently. Veterans who served as guards to the labs and ritual zones have explained what they have seen, or folders and books have been uncovered in boxes and crates belonging to the scientists. A fair few of these contained a common research goal. Giving man the power of God. Exactly the true power is often up to debate, but it appears that this is often described in Nazi research as immortality, unable to die, invincibility, or other factors surrounding losing the capacity to die in some way or another. The larger part of this research was actually legitimately based. Certain doses of chemical compounds to aid blood flow in aging people first concepts that are now used in today's transplant surgery, grafting, ointments that renewed skin, antibodies to various diseases, and fitness and dieting research. However, one set of crates discovered in Hamburg in 1999 went way off this research style. This stuff crossbred the occult experiments and immortality research. The introductory folders and proofs of concept of the research began with the principle that the brain controls the body completely and wholly. And as the brain slowly degrades around it, it continues to function. Further statements say that the reason the body is left to degrade is because the human brain is set on a biological timer, such as why butterflies can only live a day, yet other insects can often last longer. The brain tells us to die. It is proposed that as the brain grows, it begins to make connections, resulting in the human becoming more mature and having an advanced brain. At the age of 35 to 50, however, these connections slowly break down, resulting in forgetfulness, dementia, and other mental diseases reserved for the elderly. The Nazi scientists propose that the brain has a universal kill switch that activates as soon as the brain has fully developed. In all normal humans, this kill switch will initiate a shutdown sequence in bodily functions, which occurs over several decades. As soon as the body is fully shut down, the brain will be forced to die through a lack of oxygen. It is said that Winner's Syndrome, a disease where a person ages rapidly, is a result of a kill switch function activating far too early. The Nazis proposed that they could remove the kill switch and give the human mind immortality 
and from that, complete immortality. Needless to say, brain surgery was incredibly difficult during those times, but it was possible. In the stacks of folders, there were many different diagrams and past research on the brain, psychology, the human mind, and all the like. The experiments were initially proposed to Nazi executives in 1940, and permission was granted to perform the experiments in 1942, under one condition. The experiments must be conducted outside of Germany. The German populace must not see this experiment in any way, shape, or form. It was no surprise to the scientists that the executives were paranoid about public relations, but the idea of performing the research outside of the fatherland was foreign in itself. Most experiments were performed in bunkers or basements. Regardless, the scientists complied and were able to organize a setup with their ally Japan in late 1942. The research had begun, and here's where it gets strange. The research team had taken over a Japanese orphanage. The orphanage was in the hills, supposedly somewhere in Shimane, an area nearby Hiroshima. The scientists deducted that if they tried to take on the usual test subjects, older diseased people with nothing left to live for, similar in a fashion to Gateway of the Mind, they would be playing with the variable of disease, or, more importantly, they would be experimenting on a brain that has already had an activated kill switch, rendering it useless in the context of finding the solution. As a result, the Nazi scientists demanded that children, namely the orphans in the orphanage, would become test subjects. Their young brains eliminated any concern of an already activated kill switch. To begin the experiments, the children went through numerous immunizations and intense psychological testing to ensure that they would prevent any defects and keep a general benchmark for their subjects. Next, they began with the older staff of the orphanage. Put under anesthetic, the surgeons opened up their skulls to find a good cross-section of an adult brain and begin to find key differences between it and a child's brain. After gaining a model of both a child brain and an adult brain, the scientists deducted that the universal kill switch wasn't located in the brain, but in the cerebellum located at the rear. The cerebellum commands all subconscious activity in the brain which is understandable, since it isn't exactly a conscious action to set off the kill switch. Systematically, they took the tallest child in the orphanage and began to open her up. They were about to begin their first kill switch ectomy. They had managed to open up the cerebellum and remove the part presumed to be the kill switch. However, upon closing the subject up, they found that she had expired. They assumed that the incisions on the brain had been far too brash and required more precision. The body was dumped in the forest behind the orphanage. After imports of different tools and different techniques were developed, the scientists were finally able to remove the kill switch and successfully revive the patient. In May of 1943, they had taken one of the youngest girls in the orphanage and removed the kill switch. The only function she lost was the ability to sweat. After their assumed success, the scientists had celebrated, after which everyone went to sleep. The next morning, the girl did not wake up and was revealed to be comatose. After a while, she was revised successfully, and the kill switch ectomies continued. The initial success gave the doctors a new state of mind, one of refreshment. 
they were able to continue their experiments with the ease of mind that the theory was proven. Well, so they assumed. Before the doctors continued their removal research, they commissioned several doctors in from Moscow who were trained in the practice of bodily revival. Technically zombification, however, it relies on the principles of using electric shocks and artificial hearts to power the body back up. They stated the reason for this was that the original subject always became comatose or clinically dead whenever she went to sleep and then revived herself in the morning. She had no signs of this behavior before the experiment and despite the fact that she was revived, the doctors did not want to risk a success turning into a failure. The Russian scientists were put to the task of bringing her back to life whenever she expired. After several days of this, the Nazis concluded that it was safe to continue. Project Venom was a Russian experiment to create super soldiers from the theory of Dr. Frankenstein. As a repayment for the use of the Russian scientists, Russia had asked that they combine the research of Project Venom with the Nazis' ongoing experiments. Naturally, the Nazis agreed. However, the limited number of orphans was debilitating, as the Nazis required so many of them and could only offer the scientists a single girl. The Russians were contempt and began the proof of concept. They had artificially created an arm over in Moscow, which was on its way to the orphanage to be grafted on, to prove that amputation and replacement could work. In the meantime, the Russians had to prepare for this. The girl's right arm was amputated. Mysteriously, shortly after, the Russian scientists packed up their equipment and left. The replacement arm never came, and the girl was left with a bandage strapped over her kimono perpetually. The Russians were said to have left with a fearful haste, as if suddenly the air had turned too cold to their tastes. The Nazi scientists attempted to play around with their successful experiment by trying different aspects to it. Sadly, none of them worked. Here is a list of them. Entry through the forehead, performed on a 10-year-old boy. Skull was deformed and the boy had been virtually lobotomized by the end of it. However, he was not vegetative as a result, although he was mentally retarded due to the experiment. Entry through the lower jaw, performed on a 6-year-old girl. The tongue and most of the flesh on the lower jaw was removed and could not be replaced. The subject's sinuses were also scrambled. Entry through the side of the head. Subject was reluctantly half deaf. It should also be noted that there was no more anesthetic during the surgeries, and the screams were truly mortifying. Despite the failure of these, the kill switches were still removed, and the subjects acted in much the same way as the first girl, expiring upon sleep, only to be revived by morning. However, they were reduced to a mere 10 people due to all the previous failures. This included the caretakers, and they had performed surgery on all of the children. During the experiments, the scientists were told to watch over the successful children and to monitor their behavior. A diary entry from one of the scientists described some of the horrific observations that were made during sessions. They appear normal at first, just like any of the other children, playing cheerfully, learning normally. But when separated from the others, they seem off. They stroll carelessly around with a blank smile on their face, their eyes looking straight at you. If approached from behind, 
their heads snap back with ungodly speed. And for a moment, you can almost see an expression so vile on their face that it makes you want to cower. But then you realize they are just forming their dreamy smile once again. Another thing is that they follow us, but only when we're on our own. After finishing on my typewriter and heading to my room, I'm often given a fright by one of the children standing several meters down the dark hallway, staring at me. When I go off to my room, she follows me, and I shut my door, jam a chair behind it, and then I sleep safely. It feels like there are ghosts at night. They also seem to be playing a game a lot more than when we started. I haven't got much knowledge of Japanese, but it seems that the game is called Circle You, Circle You, as described by one of the translators. A group of children surround one child who sits in the center, alone. They link arms and begin to move in a circular manner around the child, making scary faces at them and singing an eerie chant. You lose if you flinch. Upon talking to them, I've noticed that they seem more dreamy, forgetful, and somewhat blank, as if the experiments have wiped their memories as well. But it's not an innocent type of dreaming, rather something more sinister. They stare at you with wide eyes and ask you questions you had never thought they would know. One time, a child asked me, when your grandmother died, did she really leave you a gold-plated watch? It may seem crazy, but my honest answer was yes. In early 1945, Hiroshima was bombed. Germany forfeited a few months earlier. All experiments conducted by the Axis powers are ground to a halt. The Germans began to pack up their equipment. Most of them have already returned home due to their mental welfare, stating that they were showing signs of insanity. Only four scientists remained at the orphanage. After sending the last set of equipment off, the scientists deemed it was only justified that they would inform the caretakers that they would be leaving. To the horror of one of the scientists and the surprise of the rest, the head caretaker, in fluent German, asked, Will you play one last game with us? The three scientists agreed, and a circle of children and caretakers formed around them. Now if you flinch, you lose. The one horrified scientist ran to the last truck and jumped on it, without looking back. If you go to Hiroshima, go around the woods, and you may find some dirt trails there. If you travel down them, you will see a beautiful forest. But if you travel down the one that has had signs of trucks going through, you will feel coals, and you will see that there is a lot of trees cut down. But don't wander from the path, or you'll likely get lost in the vast woods. If you pay attention, you will notice that the tree stumps look like kneeling people with missing heads. If you continue, the air will get cold, naturally because you're climbing uphill, right? Of course, eventually you will reach a clearing with an old stone building in the center, vines covering the place. Go inside if you want to play. 
As soon as you open the door, a foul smell will come out, similar to that of a rotting corpse. If you look down the hall, it will be dark, regardless of the time of day, since there are no lights. Continue down the hall, take the first left, and then go down that hall until you see one door that appears to be made out of a red colored wood. Open the door and you will find 10 happy children and caretakers, all wearing kimonos, playing in a normal playroom. One is missing her arm, another is missing his forehead, and a third lacks a jaw, but all are bandaged with clinical precision. The place should be very clean and tidy, dependent on your standards of such things. At once, your presence will draw the attention of everyone in the room, including the ones that look far too preoccupied or distracted. They will turn to look at you, carefree smiles from each of their pleasant faces. The head caretaker, in all of her beauty, will ask, Will you come play with us? If you say no, the door will slam shut on you. And if you try to go down the hallways and out to the exit, you will only find another dark hallway. Open any of the brown doors and you will find operating tables or bunk beds. If you continue down the third hallway, you will realize that a girl is standing several meters behind you. Her face is shrouded by shadow. Approach her and expect your doom. Continue down the hallway and try not to let her catch up with you. If you say yes, however, you will be welcomed into the room. The door will close behind you and everyone will form a circle around you. Now sit and don't flinch, a cheerful voice will say. Just follow the instructions and you will survive. All light will disappear from the room, yet you can see the circle of children, each with a vicious expression on their face. One so vile, you will probably flinch straight up. If you can stomach that though, they will begin to move around and around and around you slowly. You may feel one of them lash out towards you. If you look, however, there will be nothing there besides the children circling normally. If that wasn't enough, they will begin chanting. Kakome, Kakome. I really can't explain it any further. No one ever lives to tell the tale of what happens next. If you flinch before they chant, they simply continue as normal. If you choose to say anything but yes or no, to the head caretaker. It is told that the children's expressions will turn mortifying and they will scream in inhuman voices. Decide, decide. If you do anything but say yes or no from here, it is told that the children and caretakers will slam the door on you. If you turn around, the story varies. Supposedly, your worst fear will be waiting on the other side of the hallway, separating you from your exit. If you respond, I don't understand, and you are genuine, the head caretaker will say, Go to your school and watch the children play. You should understand then. Nothing will change. Make sure you close the door on your way out. It's a common courtesy. 
I want to thank you for getting this far. Retention time is a very important factor of the building of any channel, and unfortunately it is something I have struggled in. By making it to this point, you have displayed to me your ultimate dedication to my work, and I cannot be any more thankful. As a reward, I would like to place a slight disclaimer on this video and share with you an important fact. Some of the events described in the story were exaggerated for the sake of entertainment. But in 1942, a team of German scientists were sent to Japan by orders of the Third Reich. They were to live in an orphanage for several years and study immortality and its connection to the brain. They indeed did use the children and caretakers as their test subjects. It is unknown what happened to their research data, but it is presumed that it was destroyed after Germany's defeat. Creepypasta is only around to scare you and maybe provide you with some entertainment, but you can always roll over at night and tell yourself that it's just a story. But there are some stories out there that are more truth than fiction. This is one of them.